Broadcasting from the Prairie Sportsman Studios. Presented by OnX. Know where you stand with OnX. <clears throat> We're not just a radio show anymore. Heck yeah. This is Sporting Journal Radio. Well, Happy New Year, everybody. I hope you had a good Christmas. And as the year 2022 draws to a close, we look back on the last year and think about uh, all the things that we got to do. We're very grateful and uh, we're very fortunate for some of the opportunities that we had. Hopefully you had a good year too. And we're looking forward to all the things we get to do in 2023. I'm Brett Amundsen. That's Dan Amundsen right over there. And David hey. Eckhart. Hello, Hi, hello. Dan. And David Eckhart right over. Sorry, I thought you were going to go to all three of us. So well, I, I didn't. I apologize. <laughs> you should, as the runner, I got to even put it on me. As the runner of this show, you should clarify that before we start the show. Yeah, well, obviously, we were spending too much time pheasant hunting all day today. It's been a long day, man. That was some brutal, brutal walks through the heavy snow and the thick cattails today. And two of the guys that were hunting with us are currently snoring in the other room right now. So that'll give you an indication of what kind of a day it was out there today. But we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the pheasant conditions right now. We'll talk about ice fishing conditions right now, too. And since it is the end of the year, we're going to look back and uh, we had planned some best of type stuff for this show. And uh, basically, you're going to get uh, our interview with Jay Siemens because that was one of our favorite interviews of 2022. And we just didn't have time to put any of the other ones in. So we'll have uh, our interview with Jay Siemens. We had a great time talking to him. We could, I think we talked to him for long time a long time dan had to do a lot of editing he wasn't happy oh, about actually it. i didn't the long segments are the easy ones oh well i guess he enjoyed it and in any case we all enjoyed it and it was a good one jay's just a great guy and he's doing great things uh out there with his uh, youtube channel and of course is this uh, meat eater uh, deal that he's got going on right now so we'll talk about some of that coming up with jay in a little bit we also have Joe Henry from Lake of the Woods to give us a report. He was just up there a couple of days ago, so he's going to talk about what ice and snow conditions are like. And they caught a bunch of walleyes. They were filming a TV show. He'll tell us what he caught those fish on. Kind of a unique lure that he was using to catch those fish on. One that you might say, come on, that didn't catch any fish. And come on. Come on. Come on. Yeah, we'll find out what those were, uh, what that lure was, and how we did it coming up in just a little bit. First, though, Dan, who are the sponsors this week? This week we have On X, Know Where You Stand with On X, Lake of the Woods Tourism. Lake of the Woods is the walleye capital of the world. Plan a trip for this fall or for this winter at Lake of the Woods MN.com. Live target. Yeah, Dan, winter started hey, December. Hey, do you 21st. want to interrupt me during this or not? Because now we're way behind. Way to go. Now I got to rewind this guy. December 21st was the start of winter, by the I way. thought it was January. It's a winter solstice. Oh, wait. That was you That's a winter solstice. <laughs> now I'm angry. <laughs> Shortest day of the year. Hey, got them all flustered hey, now. Hey, December 21st. Hey, live Target. Live Target got it. Brought us this show. Are you listening? Match that. I got to rewind it. We're still <laughs> I didn't even say anything that time. Live Target. Match the hatch at LiveTargetLures.com. Haybell Heights Campground and Resort. Book a trip to Devil's Lake. Learn more at HaybellHeights.com. Alclair Audio. Save your hearing in the field with Alclair. Learn more at AlclairOutdoors.com. Ottertail Lakes Country. Find your inner otter this winter at OttertailLakesCountry.com. <laughs> and Prairie Sports, when the new season starts this winter in January, watch episodes anytime at the Prairie Sports and YouTube channel until then. Yeah, just a couple of weeks from now, actually. Pretty excited Golly. about the new season. Uh, Dylan Kerfman has been editing uh, the show and getting showing us some sneak peeks of the new season that's going to be coming out. We're real excited. By the way, uh, uh, if you're interested in sponsoring Prairie Sports, I'm just going to throw this out there. Uh, this is your last chance to do it. Uh, this show airs like over 600 times on 12 stations in seven states, plus uh, video on demand and YouTube. So it's a great opportunity to get your message out there. PrairieSportsman.org uh, for more or just get old me and I can make it happen. So i uh, pretty excited about the new season. We got a lot of really cool stuff uh, coming out there uh, on that show here in just a little bit and lots of stuff for 2023, man. I'm pretty excited. Our new Alaska film Kodiak is going to be coming out next year and uh, all, all sorts of stuff. I'm a little sad as I, this is, this is always a tough week for me because it's a, it's fun. It's holiday. A lot of people have the day off. We've been, we've been pheasant hunting every day. I love to pheasant hunt, but it all ends. I know you guys have been fishing already close. and you guys don't care about it as much as I do. You guys like to fish. You're excited about winter, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm always sad at the end of hunting season. 
So I'm a little depressed. Yeah, I think right I now. pheasant hunted once this year. Once. Yeah. I forget that you pheasant on Dave. I've gone twice. <laughs> yeah. So one more than me. Yep. And Red deer hunt a lot more though. Good. And, and the first time Dan was on the opener, right? Yep. And then you hunted today. The second time was today. <laughs> December 29th as we're recording this right now. So we're on top of the ball. But, been um, too busy, man. You put me to too much work. Yeah, right. Pheasanting has been really good again this year too. So I'm surprised that you guys haven't done it more, but I know, uh, David, you've been deer hunting quite a bit. You've had a pretty good year deer hunting. I've had a really fact. good year. Yeah. It's probably one of my best years. You shot a nice, well, let's, let's talk about, um, you're, you shot a nice buck earlier this year, right? Yes. I shot a shot a buck in September, the end of September, which is strange. I usually normally shoot my buck at, during the rut, you know, early November. And it was weird to be tagged out, you know, two weeks into the season. Yeah, I, I don't didn't really I know even, what to do. I don't think I even started bow hunting until the end of October <laughs> pretty much this year. But we were gone a lot. So, yeah. So did you have this deer on camera? Um, yeah, I had checked them that day because I've been busy and hadn't had time. So I walked in there earlier that day and saw that buck on camera and was like, yeah, I'd shoot him when he came in. And yeah, he came in early, was in the plot for at least half an hour before I, he gave a sh- gave me an opportunity to take a shot. And, oh, really? Yeah. So it, it, I got excited right away and then calm down so this is footage right now is this this is footage through binoculars yeah yep that he was about 80 yards and he just milled around that side of the food plot all night and then just before dark walked into 20 yards i was like okay i had enough time to calm down and made a good shot and he only went 100 yards and tipped over so the worst part about that was he tipped over right into a giant patch of poison ivy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Which we didn't realize till we were standing in it. Like, oh, no. Oh, man. And then this, okay, so this is after you, sh- sh- no, this is, is that snow on the ground? Is this? That's his arrow? What's oh, green grass? Oh, it is grass. Oh, green yeah, trees, that's the food plot. And that's the, the knock glowing. This is, since we're confused about seasons, this is early <laughs> fall. <laughs> Yeah, September. Okay, so uh, that's it, man. I wish I I gotta get like those lighted knocks again. I used yeah. to shoot lighted knocks on my arrows, and I haven't for the last few years. And I need to get those again because man, that makes a big difference. Because I did the deer I shot this year. I had to go back out the next day to find my arrow. Right, I couldn't find it in the dark, of course. But uh, so and that so that buck was that an eight or was that a ten? Uh, he was nine. Nine. Yeah. yeah, he had a little crab claw that oh, okay. made him nine. But yeah, but but like that'd be a big eight. Yeah. I mean, other than that crab claw there to give him the nine, the right. four by five. That's a nice deer right there, though. That's a cool, you know, big eights. There's something about big eights. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I I really want to shoot just a big mainframe, heavy eight point. That's Which that buck, you sent me that video, and I don't know if we've shared it, and I don't know if you've got it, Dan. I don't know if we can play it on here right now, but you sent me that video from South Dakota, that big buck running down the road. Yeah. Was that an eight? Because, I think it was. Because looking at the video, I mean, it's it was a huge deer. It was so wide. So wide. And and I paused it multiple times because I played it. I put it on, it was on, on Instagram. Instagram, And people were like, oh, is that a, you know, it was a big discussion if that was an eight yeah. pointer or a 10 pointer. Yeah, I've, I've done the same thing. I've paused it and scrolled back and forth and. I think it's an eight. It and looks that, like an eight. We'll see if Dan can pull. Oh, there it is right there, Dan. Look at this. Look at this deer. I mean, he's so wide. So this is on the Sporting Journal Radio Instagram uh, page. <laughs> I mean, it looks like handlebars. Yeah, he was nuts just standing on the road. I come over a hill and there he was standing with a doe. So I don't know how many times I paused it when he's jumping over that fence trying to figure out how many points he's got. But, uh, man, that's a good deer. South Dakota, I'm jealous. I need to start hunting South Dakota. And apparently I need to come just fill the freezer with a doe tag. Are doe tags, did you get that doe tag over the counter or what? Yeah. Is that a bow tag or what was it? It's an archery tag. So I bought it when I bought my my buck tag or any deer tag. So you can buy like bonus tags? You can buy three tags so you could buy three buck tags if you wanted oh. the way i understand okay the ruling but and then so then you had a doe tag in your pocket and yep. you get a message saying hey we've got some does here yeah i was actually up at my dad's and 
there's he's got a bunch of food plots and for some reason the deer herd up there in the winter and it, there were so many deer up there it was unbelievable i i'd heard him you know you know there's 100 deer in the yard every night and it's like that, okay yeah that looks like a cattle pasture it was <laughs> unbelievable i mean at any different multiple different points last night i've I had 40 deer around me so deer will obviously yard up like that and herd up in the winter is that this year we've got more snow so do you think do you think that's affected do you think that's normal or do you think that's more deer than usual um i'd say it's probably the same amount it's oh really just earlier okay they they usually get heavy like that january february around there but yeah this year with all the snow and cold that they were herded up a lot earlier and you had one night to go out there and shoot a doe yep and you, uh, it I had did not the, take long i had the pick of the crop <laughs> yeah but tell tell us about your shot because you made a, a decent a pretty good shot on that doe it was a yeah what you would consider a textbook shot it was right behind the shoulder you know with one third of the way up the body and that doe lived for probably a couple hours we we left her late for like four hours but she hadn't been dead very long and when i gutted her there was a a gash all the way across her heart yeah like how did this thing survive this long when you sent me the first video and he said it might have been a little low maybe and i looked at him like yeah it looks maybe a little bit low and then you then after you pulled the heart out and you showed the slice through the heart like how did that deer live for a couple hours after i couldn't believe it and trailing it it wasn't a small blood trail it was a spray of blood and there i found at least 15 beds she'd go 20 yards and bed down she'd get up move 20 yards bed down and it was just constant blood steady blood the whole time i'm like how it should be in the next bed and yeah, there, right. there was just more and more beds and we were gonna wait and leave it till the morning we started heading back to the yard and i'm like oh we're back back on blood oh really yeah i'm like wait this isn't the trail we were on and she had just made a big loop and went right back to the yard and she was laying right in the other tree line like oh there she is (laughs) (laughs) perfect glad we didn't leave it till morning we had our work cut out today cleaning deer now that's an interesting part of the story hearing about how that doe survived after that lethal shot but the more interesting part of your story i think is the fact that you saw two collared does over there in south dakota and i know minnesota does some collaring and we filmed a fawn collaring study that we're going to be that's going to be a part of the new prairie sportsman starting in january on pioneer pbs but I didn't know South Dakota was collaring deer, and you said these collars were a few years old. Yeah, I don't think they do it anymore. The last program they did was like 2018 or 19, and they were supposed to fall off after a year or two or three. I don't think they're transmitting anymore. I think they only have the battery life of Hmm. three years, but they're still hanging on. And we thought there was only one, because we've got pictures of it, but... I saw two different ones last night, which was pretty crazy. Well, uh, do you know, I'm going to try to look it up here, but do you know, admittedly, I don't know anything about this, but do you know anything? Are they telling you to shoot deer that you see with the collar on? I mean, most of the time those collars fall off like they're supposed to. Right. And no, I haven't. And I'm sure they want their collar back. So I was more than willing to retrieve it for them, but she just never gave me a shot. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, there's a lot about this here. It looks like 2015, 2016, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I'm I just. I think seeing. they had heard like 18 or 19 was but, the, whoever they had talked to. And this might be old, an old Google search result that I'm pulling up here. Anyway, we'll find out more about it and try to talk more about it next week here on the show. Maybe we'll try to get somebody from South Dakota Game Game and Fish and Parks to get on the show to talk about it too. But pretty interesting. Yeah. Any, in any case, all right, we better we better turn things over to uh, Joe Henry and then uh, Jay Siemens coming up. Happy New Year uh, from Sporting Journal Radio. I hope you. Uh, 
<laughs> there it is. There's our official. That's all we could afford for New Year's Eve sound effects here on the show. Uh, Happy New Year from Sporting Journal Radio. It's ice fishing season and time to plan your trip to Riverbend Resort on Lake of the Woods. Stay at the Lakeside Resort along the Rainy River in one of their new cabins and enjoy delicious meals and hot or cold beverages in the Miles Lab Bar and Grill. Or stay in one of their comfortable sleeper houses on the ice complete with a TV, stove, and lots of walleyes right beneath your feet. You also have the option of staying at their motel, the Walleye Inn, located in Bidet. Book your ice fishing trip to famous Lake of the Woods today at riverbendresort.com. That's riverbendresort.com. Live Target, the leader in Match the Hatch, is back with new lures that also match the action. Introducing the Live Craw. The Live Craw is irresistible to bass, walleye, and other freshwater species. f winner, the ultimate frog, looks and acts just like a swimming frog. With an exposed ultra point mustad hook and replaceable legs, the ultimate frog has two styles, two sizes, and eight colors. And I cast an f winner, the live shrimp mimics a fleeing shrimp for saltwater anglers. Coming soon from Live Target. Ice fishing season is here. This winter, plan a trip to Devil's Lake, North Dakota. Not only will you have the chance to catch their legendary perch, but this year, Hay Bale Heights has been catching big walleye after big walleye. And they're doing it from a mobile, comfortable snow bear. No matter how cold it is outside, you're warm and toasty on the inside. Learn more and book a trip today at haybaleheights.com. That's haybaleheights.com. All right, now it's time to head up to Lake of the Woods to check in with Joe Henry from Lake of the Woods Tourism. Joe, did you have a good Christmas? Oh, man, I had, I had a wonderful Christmas, Brett. How about you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I I, 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 it, I always feel weird about it because it I feel like it takes away a couple of days from the end of my hunting season a little bit or, you know, maybe some of that early ice fishing just a little bit. But you have to take some time uh, to spend with family. And I had a, I had a good time and uh, got to see some people that I only get to see one or two times a year. Got some great stuff, of course. Got to give, uh, got to give away some great presents, which my... <laughs> So my my Christmas presents, full disclosure, I just give everybody cash. Yeah. And uh, I got halfway to the cities and realized I left all my Christmas presents on my kitchen counter. <laughs> Thankfully, there was an ATM along the way. So I had a great Christmas. By the ATM, you mean your phone? I did Venmo everybody this year. That's right. I had to get, I'd get cash out for my parents because they don't Venmo. And I give my cash parents for Christmas, but everybody else I just Venmoed. Perfect. But uh, yeah, I had to get. Well, I was thinking about Christmas, machine. and you know, I was thinking about how how much prep goes into Christmas, and how, you know, how fast it comes and how fast it goes, and and I, uh, um, I, I read it. I read at my church once in a while, so I was reading at church a week before Christmas, and you know, just just trying to focus on the real, you know, as they say, the real reason for the season. You know, maybe that's because my is that my age? Is that am I no. still my age? When jo- I- Joe, I'll say. Yeah, I mean, obviously, getting together with family is the best part about it. Uh, is one of the best parts about it. I, obviously, uh, the reason for the the season is the best part about it. And honestly, the Christmas Eve church service uh, I've been going to since I could since I can remember is my favorite part of Christmas. We go there at eleven. I think the service starts at eleven, goes till about mid night we raise the candles during silent night the whole the whole thing and it's uh it's a great experience i love it that's neat you know i uh, um respect everybody what everybody's beliefs are you know uh, certainly my faith is a big part of what i who i am and and uh, that that was a big part of it and you know that, that's really neat uh my uh, my daughter had a baby here about uh, five weeks ago so my my first grandchild and you know I tell you you want to talk about best christmas gift ever i mean that that just is a game changer and and uh, and then you know I reflected back to the days when I lived in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. I uh, I worked in Cleveland for about four years, and when I would come home for Christmas, I would come home and spend a few days with my family. And on December 26, religiously, since we talked about faith, December 26, I'd be heading north to Lake of the Woods. And this yeah. is well before I was tourism director, and I'd go up to Lake of the Woods and spend three or four days. And I would, you know, a lot of times I was even by myself, and I actually enjoyed that. And I would I would fish that 15, 16, 17 feet off of Pine Island for the morning, uh, morning evening bite. You know those fish will slide in. There's always there's always a morning evening bite along the shallows. It's hit and miss though. You don't always hit it, but if you do, it could be incredibly good. But I I would go out and I would do that, and then during the day, you know I would go out and uh, do the the bite out deep for the saugers and, and mixed in walleyes and, and stuff and. Um, and then at night, you know, this time of year, there's so many bowl games on. I'd go to one of the local resorts. I'd mix it up. 
and I'd go sit at the bar by myself, have a couple of beers, have a nice dinner, and watch a bowl game. And, and that's actually how I got to know a lot of resort owners up at Lake of the Woods well before I was tourism director. In fact, that's one of the my understanding is that's one of the ways they they reached out to me when uh, when the job came available. But you know, it again, you know, think about it. It's going up to Lake of the Woods. It's you just can start driving trucks out. You're doing the morning evening bite. You're doing the the, the deep bite for saugers and walleyes and pout and everything else out in the deep. Then you go into the many resorts, having yeah, a couple of drinks, having the dinners. Everybody's festive. It's very, very, a lot, a lot of stuff going on up there. I mean, it is, it's freaking fun, but it's fun on a lot of different levels. Uh, Joe, you mentioned the morning and evening bite. I was just reading a post on Facebook, and I believe everything I read on Facebook and on the internet, <laughs> but they were saying that it's not true that there's no night bite on Lake of the Woods. Oh, my gosh. You know, <laughs> um, you know, I we're both because of our work in the media. We're both involved in social media, and yeah. uh, you know, there is just some comments. Uh, there's some know it alls out there and everything. And you know, I, I I respect everybody's opinion, but you know, here's the deal with a night bite in Lake of the Woods. You know, Lake of the Woods has stained water, and the reason the water is stained is because the watershed it drains from the south north and is coming out of those the bogs that are south of us. So the bogs put natural tannins that stain that water, kind of a coffee color. With that coffee colored water, here's the thing. Biologically, the, the fish biologists from the DNR will tell you that a fish will expend naturally as little energy as possible in order to catch its prey, its meal. So walleyes with those big, big eyes that can see better than other fish, you know, especially on clear water lakes, they're gonna wait until dark. They're not gonna chase minnows around all day and perch around all day. They're gonna waste too much energy. They're gonna wait until they can ambush and when they can see, and those other fish can't. Well, Lake of the Woods, because of that stained water, that ambush opportunity is all day long. In fact, a lot of times the walleyes and saugers cigar, will bite better when the sun's out and when it's 10 o'clock until 2.30 sometimes. I mean, it, it all depends, but um, but do, do walleyes and saugers bite at night? Yeah, sometimes they do. Sometimes you'll catch a few. Overall, when you're in a sleeper house at night, you'll get some eel pout. Normally, you're not gonna get a lot of walleye and sauger action. That's just the truth of it. Yeah, and I, and I and I remember that too because when I first started going up there, and we were taking bus trips up to Ballard's uh, from Fargo, from the radio station up there, I would uh, I, we'd we'd go out at well, we'd usually be on our way out at six or seven in the clock in the morning, and sometimes there's an hour ride in the bomber depending on how far we were going, and we'd be coming in around four o'clock, and I finally pulled uh, one of the guys aside. I'm like, hey, guy, why don't we, why aren't we out here for early morning and in the evening? And he kind of looked at me and said, it's a day bite up here, and that's the first time I'd heard that about Lake of the Woods, and I was like, okay, this is this is clearly just the resort trying to, you know, keep, you know, run a daily operation of moving that many people in and out. And then over the years, obviously, I've been up there many times. I've stayed in sleepers. I've fished after dark. I've fished during the day. And it, yes, we did catch a couple of fish after dark, but it was once that sun came up. That's when the fish really started to bite. That's when all the action happened. And I truly became the, uh, you know, I got to experience the day bite on Lake of the Woods and understand just what it means to uh, to have a day bite or a night bite. And, and we've said it many times here on the show that uh, you, you'll you see the guys in the coffee shops up there, the locals, and they'll watch all the people traveling to Lake of the Woods to fish, head out there right before sunrise, and they'll just sit there drinking their coffee and head out around eight or nine or whatever and, and uh, have a great day fishing out there. So... I remember, I remember the old timer. I heard some old timers say, "Eh, yeah, let's get another cup of coffee. We'll let those rookies get out there first. Right, and yeah. they, for, for a good reason, right? Well, and I will say though, uh, eel power fishing is becoming so so uh, so popular these days that I could see people wanting to stay out after dark less for walleyes, but more for bourbon. Yeah, exactly. Well, and you know, here's the thing: is that. We have a lot of sleepers on Lake of the Woods, and it's, it's a blast being on the sleepers. It's like ice camping at 70 degrees. You cook your own meals. People bring games and music and televisions and, you know, everything else in today's world, you know. And uh, um, but the, the, there's another group of people that would much rather just go back to shore, have a por porcelain plumbing, a good, comfortable bed, um, have a chance to go to the different resorts, eat out and, and have a couple drinks and you know, everybody's different. I've done them both. I like them both. Um, yeah. You know, as I get older, more often than not, being that I don't own a sleeper fish house, um, if I owned if I owned a sleeper, certainly I'd be staying on that ice more and more. But being that I got rid of my sleeper, I uh, 
you, you know, I'll, I'll spend more time in the cabins. And but again, b- both are nice options. Isn't it great that there's options like this? And we're talking yeah. about. Them. Well, I know. And sometimes on real busy, real busy weekends up there, sometimes uh, people that just want to travel the Lake of the Woods, they just rent sleeper fish houses instead of a motel room somewhere. So yeah. and, and it's kind of an adventure and it's fun to, and it's a great option to have. Uh, let's talk about what conditions are like right now. Obviously, it warmed up a little bit this week, but we've had such such cold temperatures. We've been building great ice all over the place. And you were just up there at Lake of the Woods, weren't you? I was, yeah, yeah. So I, uh, I shot a TV show, a Midwest Outdoors TV show with our good friend Greg Jones, and uh, you know we uh, we fished in a day house, and uh, you know uh, ice conditions were really good. I mean, we were up there during that cold spell, so we were talking to the ice guides, and uh, the ice guides were saying, "Yeah, I gained two inches last night," and I mean, it was really putting on some good inches. So, um, you know, we all say about Lake of the Woods, it's such a big lake that you know every road, ice road, can be different with ice conditions. So you really need to say, when you say, what are, what's ice like? How's ice doing up at Lake of the Woods? Well, you know what? It depends on which road. So contact your local resort or outfitter and find out what their weight limits are. I can tell you that there are some, uh, um, some ice roads now that are, are letting out uh, one ton trucks. There are some that are, you can pull a, take a pickup and pull your, your wheelhouse out now. Uh, there's other roads that aren't allowing that weight limit, that, 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 that much weight yet. So it just kind of depends on where you're going to go, but it's game on. And this cold weather has helped build ice. I, I know the uh, um, the Igloo Bar, they're talking about putting that out just before the first of the year. They had 18 inches as of last week in that spot. They're going to put it out. Um, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't forget, too, and I, I didn't talk to uh, Justin over at Cyrus because, you know, the Igloo Bar goes out of Zippo Bay. The Angry Walleye is the second ice bar now, and that goes out of uh, – Cyrus Resort. Oh. So if, if you're up there, if you're going to hit a couple of ice bars, don't forget that angry walleye. It's kind of a fun one too, and uh, it's not real far offshore, so you can get there. It is. There's an angry walleye, but uh, yeah. So you know, um, th- things are happening, and thankfully we got that cold spell. We really needed it. I mean, you know, when we're when when the resorts are constantly getting pushed. Hey, when's your ice? We, can we get up here? We're bringing our ice house. We're getting our truck. Can we do this. Calm down. Mother Nature is going to dictate. We're going to see how things go. It's day by day because we're going to go out there and measure the ice. And that's what they do. So we have another reason to come up there to Lake of the Woods now, Dan. What's that? The new bar. Well, yeah. To check out. David's in, I know. Yeah, count yeah. me in. <laughs> Whoa. Well, Brett, if, if, He's so if, uh, excited. If the new bar. The Don't get have, choked up about it. I'm really excited. If the new bar is called the Angry Wall Play, what do you call your nephew, Dan? Dan Sizzle. What would he be called? Mark Smith Jeez. gave Dan a new nickname when we were up in Alaska. <laughs> Dan Sizzle. Sizzle? Yeah, Dan Sizzle. Oh, so, why is that? Well, he was making some duck. He was frying up some duck, and, uh, you know, he was sizzling. Dan was Dan was sizzling. He's just like he Dar, Dar Sizzle on Instagram. Can't stop the sizzle. If you know who Dar Sizzle is, he's just like her. Look her up. She's. <laughs> I wear much, similar clothing. Pretty much the same person. But, David, uh, what would you, Instagram what, what following you is for Danny? Not in your bikini pictures. David, what but... nickname do you have for Danny? <laughs> What's that, Joe? I want to know what nickname David has for Danny. <laughs> hmm, I don't know yet. Careful. <laughs> I'll have to think on that. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to be coming up there at the end of January for uh, an aglow trip, Joe. I'd assume you'll be up there for that as well. Yeah, plan on it. I, uh, I have a sports show in Chicago that butts up against it, but uh, we're going to try to make it work. Oh yeah, are you which b- before that? Because we're going to a sh- Chicago sports show right after that. Oh um, yeah. Well, the one I'm going to is in Schaumburg, Illinois, and it's uh, it's the uh, Chicagoland Fishing Sport, and it's at uh, the uh, uh, Schaumburg uh, Convention Center, so it's that northwest suburb of Chicago, and uh, it's b- great great show, good crowd. I've been going there for quite a few years. I'll be doing seminars again this year, and uh, it's a good one. Well, uh, we'll see up there. In any case, I know we're bringing, Dan got a whole bunch of live target stuff. We had a huge box of live target stuff to bring up there for that for that trip at the end of January. I'll tell you, I'll tell you one of the things you're going to want to consider bringing are those uh, lipless crankbaits. That's got a bunch got. of them. Yep. And, you know, those, and, you know, whether, whether you use a, a rattle, uh, most people know them as a, like a rap rip and wrap, right? But the live targets have uh, some really good lures too and s- similar type deal. And uh, well, I'll tell you what, between those rattles and that vibration, we uh, we had done real well on uh, on those kind of baits. What did you catch fish on when you were up there last week, Joe? Well, you know what we used a um, so a number four rip and wrap. Uh, Greg was using a um, 
that kind of that green fire tiger. I think it's probably a a, a, a green UV fire tiger. Uh, I was using the pink UV fire tiger uh, on a rip and wrap, and they worked at times. It was interesting. There's times of the day they would work, and there's times where the fish just didn't care for them. Um, in addition, we were jigging some spoons. I was jigging that new Keep It Clean stop sign uh, uh, spoon, which is glow uh, glow white with a Keep It Clean logo on one side and gold on the other. Tipped out with a minnow head. That was working well for a while. Which is, which is awesome, by the way, because a lot of times you'll see these logo lures, and then they're just gimmicky things. And, oh, yeah. you'll, you know, oh. when we do the governor's fishing openers at different places, you'll get you'll get a uh, you'll get like a, uh, a spoon or something with some of these logos. Yeah, some advertising marketing. It's a it's a genius marketing move, but. I've never used any of them. Like they go on a shelf or they go into the tackle box or they get thrown away eventually, whatever it is. But, but you were catching fish on this one. Well, and the thing is, I mean, I don't know if I can add a lure designer to my resume anymore, but you know, um, we, we talked about, Hey, I want to have a good color. And what, what color can we put this logo on? He goes, well, I said, how about glow white? That'll show up really nice. He goes, yeah, glow white would be a great color. And then I said, well, can we have a gold base, gold and glow white? Now think about it. Gold and glow white, and then you get that keep it clean lure that's got green and it's got blue in it and a little bit of yellow. Talk about perch colors. So whether you're fishing clear water, stained water, um, at night because of the glow, I mean, it's really a versatile lure, but um, but that was actually working really good. You know, another lure I like using is um, there's a macho minnow. And, you know, a macho minnow is from Northland, and I want to – and I'm not – brand specific i just show you the what we're using but there's a macho minnow and that macho minnow has a little piece of um, metal tail that's on that bottom clevis where the bottom treble hook goes on that spoon and i think that kind of clinks against that spoon there it is and i think that and danny the gold the golden red one i don't know if you find the golden red one on there super glow uh, redfish Nope, nope, that's, um, no, well, that's, that one's good that one's good but there's one that's gold that one. on one side and it's kind of a gold and uh gold and red together on the other side and uh that's well i'll tell you what man um that that well, how about that one right there gold. that's that's gold on one side there's one that's gold and red and then i know which one side, you're talking about i just got to find it here it's got mm-hmm. a gold red on the other side of it i think yeah on the back side but that that has been a really really go-to lure and sometimes you know i'll downsize that lure so i'm using just kind of a smaller one and uh, man i'll tell you what that that's been a good one you know another uh Northland lure that I have not tried yet, but I think it's going to work real good. I, I've heard it's worked real good. They got a new coffin spoon out. I was just going to ask you about spoon, that one. Yeah, well, that's got the rattles in it yeah. in addition to that flapper. You know, so that's a good one. And then, um, you know, I, I do like the uh, uh, the leech flutter, uh, the clam leech flutter spoon, they call it. Um, there's a, the buckshot coffin. The the, uh, the flutter spoon from clam um, that that's uh, just a, re- a really good lure. It's a light lure. It's got nice action when you when you jig it. And then you know on the dead stick, two things were working quite well for me. Number one, I was using a demon, uh, demon just kind of a glow in the dark, almost like a bigger crappie jig. Um, and that's always been a go to for crappie fish, and I use it for walleyes all the time. And then in addition, uh, a plain red hook with a live minnow about a foot off the bottom. You know th- those two things. And there's times where the dead stick was outproduced on the jigging line. There's times where the jigging line would outproduce in, in the same day. So that's why it's important to have them both going. Well, I'm excited to get up there. It's time. I've got just a couple of days left. Well, but well, just a couple of days left, I suppose, before the hunting season ends uh, for uh, for us. I suppose by the time this airs. So I'm well, Joe. You got, I'm you got, uh, you got pheasants, right? Pheasants, yeah. Pheasants are just about over here. January, yeah. January one. So I've I've got a new live scope that I'm excited to try out. So I'm, gonna, I'm finally going to start ice fishing a little bit. I'm excited about it. And what? We're, we're going to be up there in about a month. Month from uh, a couple days ago, as a matter of fact. You got a new we'll live there, scope. Well, I'll tell you, last time I was an official to the live scope up at Lake of the Woods, uh, it was Brian Bashor. and okay. uh, Brian Bashore was using. It and he was. I, 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 I think it was a live scope. No, maybe, maybe, maybe it was a hummingbird. He might be sponsored by a hummingbird. I got to be careful. But it was a forward-facing sonar, and he'd be like, "Okay, there's two, there's two fish coming from the left. I think they're coming over by your hole." Okay, they stopped and looked at the lure. Yep, one of them stopped there. Oh, that one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was just incredible. It's insane. It's not yeah. that tight cone angle. You can see around the fish house, like outside of it. Well, I got to spend some time with with Danny Thompson and uh, and Steve Panaz using that in a hundred feet of water. Their new uh, live scope xr where they go they can go 100 feet or three they can go like 300 feet wasn't it something like that with that they're pretty far yeah and they caught a big lake trout and you could see 
the tail kicking as they were bringing this fish in and all the water displaced, all the bubbles and, and the water displacement, it, it just looked like this big cloud of water coming off the tail. I mean, it's, uh, the, it's pretty insane when you, when you think about it. It's crazy technology. Yeah. I know Danny and, uh, actually Steve, uh, Steve gave me a call last week. He was up fishing too. And uh, we, we chatted a little bit, but, uh, yeah, no, um, that, that's going to be fun to use. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for you. It's, 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 it'll be fun just to see what's coming through. And, you know, like you said, there's so much detail. Sometimes you can tell by the profile of the fish what kind of fish it is. Yeah. Oh, well, absolutely. All right. Well, we'll try it out. We'll fish with you here in about a month up at Lake of the Woods. Joan, if people want to get a trip planned up there for this winter, what should they do? You know what? Hey, check out our website. And that is lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Come ice fish the famous waters of Minnesota's Lake of the Woods, the walleye capital of the world. Experience full service resorts featuring heated fish houses, ice transportation, meal plans, and sleeper house options. From the northwest angle to the south shore, Rainy River and Baudette, the Midwest number one ice fishing destination. Walleye, sauger, perch, and northern pike, Minnesota's Lake of the Woods, best fishing anywhere. For more information, log on to lakeofthewoodsmn.com. 852 million acres of public land, 147 million private properties, all in the palm of your hand. The number one hunting GPS app just got better. With hundreds of custom map layers, 3D and topographic maps, you can easily scout on the road or at home before you go. And now you can get important weather details, CWD detection, and even know what crops have been planted where. Get the most trusted hunting GPS app ever made. Onyx. Know where you stand with Onyx. Looking for winter adventure? Might as well pick a place with over 1,000 lakes. Ottertail County, Minnesota is in the middle of everywhere, offers a simpler pace, and has something for everyone. Find your inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. All right, our next guest is a is a busy, busy guy. Uh, not just from doing various other podcasts in addition to to ours, but he's continuing to bring us high quality content on his YouTube channel, and now working with Meat Eater. It's Jay Siemens. He joins us on the show. Uh, Jay, thanks for taking time out and uh, joining us here today. Thanks, guys. Congrats on the on the Meat Eater partnership. First of all, that's awesome. Hey, that that one kind of just came out of the blue, like. Uh my uh my wife and i started mediator like starting started watching it on netflix i don't know maybe two years ago and she became like just like obsessed with it like watching it faster than i could just binge watching it and it kind of got her into outdoor you know hunt, hunting shows and that sort of stuff so it was, it was pretty cool when all of a sudden i got an email from them and she's like no you're joking i'm like no it's it's i don't know it's social media right anyone can see any video so you never know who's who's watching something when you put it on youtube right and apparently someone from media was watching so yeah that's crazy so you just got an email one day and they're like I hey, got this, an email. This, is, this is meat eater uh we want you to do some stuff for us Th that's basically what it was and i was just like <laughs> okay well i'll believe like i i i feel like i've i've had enough instances where i've had those exciting you know uh, you know opportunities present themselves and then something falls through like i um yeah, I've had trips before. It's like, hey, we, Jay, we really want you to come film this trip. And then it's like things fall through at the last minute. So until it's actually happening, I, I really don't, I try not to get too excited about those things. But it, it, it did actually happen. And uh, yeah, it's just a cool, a cool crew to be, uh, to be working with. And yeah, uh, yeah they're, they're doing big things in the outdoor world. Well, Meat Eater is like a, a new media juggernaut right? Like it, yeah. it's been interesting to watch because you had the old traditional media, uh, you know, companies like the Linders and in fish and, yeah. and, uh, the outdoor sportsman group. And then all of a sudden just meat eater comes out. I, obviously they had some help from Netflix, but they just kind of came out of nowhere. And now they've got all these podcasts. They got all these YouTube shows. They're just becoming kind of this outdoor media empire out there. Yeah. I, I think the in fisherman is, is a good uh, parallel to draw because yeah, they, and, and, and I think so many people have viewed uh, Meat Eater as just Stephen Ronella for the longest mm -hmm. time. And that's, I think, the biggest thing that they were trying to not combat because we know, like, Steve, Steve's, you know, he's the man. He's, he's got just a massive amount of talent. Yeah. Um, but it's it, Meat Eater is so much bigger than just Steve now because they brought the amount of writing talent they have. Like, that's where they definitely uh, push into is a lot of their writers. If you look on their website, the amount of written content they have is, is uh, it's exceptional. So well, it's, I, it's cool. And, and yeah. 
Well, I was just going to say, I think that's what makes uh, Steve Rinella so good at his job is he comes from that writer background, you know, a, a good yeah. writer that can also translate to other media like like broadcast media, like television, that that's just going to make a, a host that's more well versed in you know communicating and, and having a, a background, a knowledgeable background in the outdoors. I think that's really helped him and his company out. Oh yeah, the way that he can articulate hunting to people that don't hunt, and mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's that's a that's a special skill for sure. Storytelling, man, and yeah. and now the Canadian angle. Tell us about the Canadian angle and what people can expect from it. Yeah, so. Um, Meat Eater was just, they're, they're hoping to do more fishing stuff because, you know, they are hunting focused. They said, hey, Jay, do you want to help, you know, build out the fishing side a little bit more? And so I, I kind of brainstormed some episode ideas and they were like, well, we need to come up with a name. So, you know, kind of a play on words with angling, angle. Most of the episodes are filmed in Canada. So Canadian angle, it kind of, it kind of just worked out. Um, obviously there's a place called the Northwest angle as well on Lake mm -hmm. of the Woods, which was a third play on words that I wasn't really even uh, expecting. But, um, yeah, something that, uh, something that got brought up there. Um, but yeah, so I, I just finished the second season. We did one open water season that I, I think went well. And they said, Hey Jay, can you do an ice fishing season? I'm like, okay, yeah, let's, let's film it this winter and we'll put it up next winter. And they're like, can you film it this winter? And we'll put it up in, in January. And I'm just like, uh, okay, well, we'll try. So that was, that was frantic to do it. I'm glad I did it. Cause I, I just, it was, it was a, you know, a cool opportunity. And it, it worked out, but it was like that consumed a lot of my December, January, and it's, it's been pretty frantic. So to, so to get those seasons done, uh, it was cool. And to just share it with a, a different audience, because I don't know, it's like every, and it's also like, I'm a little bit nervous too putting stuff on YouTube because I feel like everyone is there to watch Steve Rinella yeah. and they're not necessarily, not necessarily there to, to see me. So it's like, you know, I, as much as you shouldn't do it, you're always reading the comments and you're like, Hey, wh what is someone going to think of this? And, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's as a creative, as a photographer, videographer, it's like, it's what I like to make, what I'm passionate about. And, uh, I, I think it was, it was well received. So yeah, I, I uh, it sounds like there'll probably be a third season. So, so nice. I'm excited about that. That's and, awesome, dude. Yeah. That's, you know, congratulations. Um, thank you. Is it like how much direction, uh, you know, like how much input are they having? Are they just saying, Hey man, this is kind of what we're looking for. Go do your thing. Is it kind of an extension of what we see? You know, are you trying to make it an extension of what you're doing already? Just maybe, you know, trying to just kind of continuing to improve on your craft or yeah. is it, or do they have some ideas for you? No. And, that, and that's probably like my, my favorite part is I'm, I'm always open to criticism and critique and like change the stuff. But as, as a videographer and I used to do, you know, the corporate stuff more, the worst thing when you do a video is like you create a video and they're like, Hey Jay, we got 18 changes for you to make. And you go back and forth. And the thing about what I do now and with YouTube is I make the video, I click upload and I don't, I don't really have to answer to anybody, which is, which is nice. Like I, not that I, not that I post controversial stuff, but it's just like, it's nice to be like, yep. I like the song choice. I like where that transition happened. I'm going to upload it. And of the eight episodes I've sent to meat eater, they haven't had any changes, no, no critiques, which, you know, from my standpoint, it makes it easier for me to keep creating um, because sometimes it'll just turn into hurdles after a while. And, and as a creative, um, y you want to create how you want to create. And you, you don't always want to be micromanaged. And I've never felt that with me either. They've been like, yep, they're all good to go. And that, and that's, that's, that's cool. I, I like that. So, I mean, I try to, I take my style and maybe I try to like, not mimic, but maybe just make sure it's a little more of like uh, fits into the meat eater style. Like if I was going to use more of an electronic, I don't want to say dubstep. I don't really use that much dubstep music, but like a, an electronic type song, I might swap it out for more of an acoustic, like folky song mm, for the meat eater sure. audience. Cause that's, that's what I visualize a little bit more. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun and um, yeah, just connecting with the crew. And finally I, I, I was just in Devil's Lake uh, early yeah. January and got to meet with a bunch of the, I got to meet Steve finally and got to meet Cal, got to meet Chester and Seth. And uh, it, it was just great to, you know, to meet some of the, the main faces of Meat Eater and finally make that connection and, and fish Devil's Lake for the first time. So that was, that was a, Wait, a dream trip for me, for sure. That was something I was going to ask you about, because you, you're you from not far from Devil's Lake, right? Just across the border from yeah, kind I, of I by grew up like an hour and a yeah, I grew up an hour and a half away, like right on the right on the border there, right by the the Pemina Nietzsche crossings. Those are the two crossings I'm close to, and 
Devil's Lake was always on my radar, but just, you know, never made it. It's, it's just like, there's lots of fish in Canada, but yeah. I wanted to go to Devil's. And, and the thing that like sparked my interest in Devil's more than anything else was going to fish for the white bass. So I got to do some white bass fishing when I was down there. And that was cool. Just something I'd never caught through the ice before. And then, I don't know. I was, uh, there you go. Um, the white bass were super cool. We ate a couple and I got to experience, you know, dark house spearing for pike, which was probably my favorite part of the whole trip. I'd never been around that before. Hmm. Uh, like it's not, I, I don't think it's legal to spear pike in Manitoba or Ontario. It's just, yeah. So to be able to be part of that in North Dakota, it felt like a cultural Dakota type thing to be a part of. And that, that was, that was super cool. For sure. That's a great fishery there. Uh, of course. So I, I just want to back up one second to working with yeah. a, a group like meat eater because, I feel like, you know, what we're doing here, what you're doing there and what you've been able to accomplish with YouTube is being your own boss and having your own company. And there's always that worry. And it sounds like you don't have to worry about it, but there's always that worry when you end up doing, you know, working with a company that's a bigger company or a corporate type company and, and worry, you know, all of a sudden you're working for somebody else again. And yep. uh, a meat eater, I, I'd assume would be a little bit of a different situation since it seems like, you know, you're basically working with the same kind of dudes that, you know, you and I are, but yeah. you know, is there, is, was there that worry about, how much control you're going to have? Is it going to, you know, what direction uh, this might go? Yeah, I think I think if season one didn't go so smoothly, there there probably wouldn't have been a, a season two because that's that's kind of the reason why I you know like doing the YouTube stuff and that's why I've pushed more into the YouTube stuff than uh, doing you know commercial commercial videography. I used to shoot a lot of stuff for different clients and and um, you know maybe YouTube isn't the most uh, you know lucrative of, of channels I could have gone, but it's what I'm most passionate about. And, you know, for, for just what I like to do, there's, yeah, like, like you said, I'm not, I'm not being micromanaged yeah. and uh, yeah. So, and meat eater has been just amazing for that. It's like, yeah, you know, sometimes they'll bounce ideas. They'll be like, Hey Jay, what four videos are you thinking of? So I'll send them six ideas and they'll be like, yeah, let's do those four. And that's kind of as, as involved as they get. Perfect. And um, so it's, it's cool. Yeah, that's nice. You know, YouTube is a tough nut to crack. And I know creators aren't making as much money off YouTube as they used to. But if you can, if you can essentially create with some sponsors and get it on a platform like YouTube and then generate the amount of viewership, uh, you know, like you have like 114,000 subscribers, man, that's unreal. Like that's, that's I, I, like how long did it take you to get there? When did you start with that? And how, like a guy starting out on YouTube now, how does he get to that level? Yeah. I mean, I think the common, so I, I started off by filming for a guy named Aaron Weeb on cut angling. If you guys watch YouTube fishing, you've probably seen Aaron's videos before. And something that I learned from Aaron is just like being tunnel visioned on it. And, and I think there's a lot of people that dabble with YouTube, but unless you go, you know, just head first into it, it's, it's really tough. Um, and then and that's why it can, it can be tough. I was fortunate that I was in a position where I was a business owner and I had a flexible schedule and I had an, I had an editor on salary already. Right. So I had a guy oh. that could edit videos and then I could start making videos. A lot of these people that, it, you know, a lot of them still that do make their living on YouTube, they're editing all their videos themselves. Right. They come home from a trip, they edit for three days, they go fish again. And so like, yeah, I was, I, I, I started my channel four years ago with my production company going on. And I would say in the last two years, I was kind of just laser focused. I would take the odd corporate job, but it was like, I want to see what the potential is of YouTube. It's where I get the most joy and fulfillment from. It's, it's a cool that I can, you know, meet great people. Like, you know, you guys and connect with, connect with people to watch the videos and all that stuff. And it's just like, I want to push more into that, even though, you know, like I said, it, it might not be lucrative. It's just like what I love. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's been my dream to be a part of some sort of fishing show. I never needed to be in front of the camera. That was never like something that was like, I need to be in front of the camera. I was like, I want to be part of a fishing show. That was, that was my goal. And then when I started filming with Aaron, I was, you know, completely content being behind the camera. Now I'm in front. I could go to being behind the camera. If all of a sudden YouTube, you know, dried up tomorrow, I'd be, you know, back to shooting and I'd be telling stories and I'd be just as content. So um, just doing the YouTube thing now while it's, while it's working and trying to put as much, you know, uh, as much effort into it as I can. I think sometimes I, cause I do the same. I'm in front, I'm behind the camera. Sometimes I feel like being behind the camera. I have, I enjoy that more. I mean, everybody wants, yeah. you know, everybody that's been in this type of industry has wanted to host their own show or whatever, but man, I love getting the shot. 
Right. And then, yeah. and as, as tedious as video editing can be some days, I, that's, I spend all my, all my time editing videos. Now it seems like yeah. my arms hurt, like all my forearms. It's like carpal, carpal, carpal tunnel. tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And here's the thing. This is, this is what I've heard. I've, I've heard Bill Linder say this and, and you know, some other people too. And I'll say it myself, I don't think I'm a fantastic angler. I think, you know, I can, I can find fish. I can catch fish from time to time, but I, I think I, I would pride myself in like the, you know, the, the, the filming in that aspect, because I think there's a lot of people that could catch the fish better than me. So I, I, I'm like, I want to be the guy that catches the shot, like the top yeah. water strike. Cause like everything has to go right to capture that in slow-mo and everything. So that's why, like I get, I get just as much, if not more enjoyment from capturing a strike like that than, than catching the fish, catching the fish is great but I think there's people that could do it better than me. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it just sure. works out that sometimes I'm filming myself and it, it makes the most sense that I'm, I'm the guy catching the fish cause I'm, I'm got the camera on a tripod filming myself, but it, it could be, it could be anyone. Uh, I'll tell you my, my buddy, I love to fish too, but again, I'm the same way. There's guys that are better at it than I am, but my, all my buddies make fun of me for always having you, are you really taking pictures of this again? Or for you really yeah. have to film this again? I'm like, well, yeah, it's like, I enjoy it. And that top water stuff, that slow-mo, um, we got to take a quick break for the radio network. But when we come back, I want to talk about some slow-mo footage with you. I want to talk about some of the films that you've made it, you've made because you do different styles of videos but those films i think those are definitely my favorite you did a week in the yukon a week in the amazon which is wild and uh and some other places too so we're going to talk uh talk about some of that stuff uh coming up more at jay siemens when we come back looking for winter adventure might as well pick a place with over 1,000 lakes Ottertail County, Minnesota is in the middle of everywhere, offers a simpler pace, and has something for everyone. Find your inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. We're back. Thanks for tuning into this station on the Sporting Journal Radio Network by downloading the podcast, or maybe you're watching us on YouTube, Facebook, Rumble, Instagram, wherever the place is that you're getting this stuff. Thank you very much. If you like it, share it with your friends. Our guest right now is Jay Siemens. He's uh, got the Canadian angle with the meat eater, media juggernaut. He's also got his own juggernaut on YouTube with 114,000 subscribers. He does a good job. And one of the reasons, Jay, I think that you're successful, we were talking about it before the break, is... Uh, obviously you know how to catch fish, but you're, and you're, and you're great with a camera, but I think you're also like just a good person, right? Like people enjoy, I think some seeing someone that's, you know, kind of down to earth, obviously you have to have some personality, you're good on camera, but you do good work and you seem like a nice guy. And I think that translates to the content that you're, you're creating. And I think a lot of people, uh, can relate to that or, or, you know, resonate with that. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know. Like I, something that I always strive to, you know, create when I'm creating content is like, I want something that everybody can watch too. I'm, I'm very careful. I just know that like the internet's a scary place and like a lot of parents will just give their kids their devices and oh, not yeah. that, you know, so it's, it's like, I, I would, you know, I want my videos to be something that any, any kid can pick up and watch and, 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 you know, just, you know, maybe it can make their day a little bit better or give them a laugh or they can learn something. So that, that's kind of like one of the, the core things I think about when I, when I make videos and, uh, I'm always hard on myself. I don't think I have a, a great personality for the video. I think I'm lucky that I know the camera stuff, but <laughs> I always give myself a hard time. Like if you want to watch some entertaining, there's a lot more people that are entertaining. I think, I think I can get a little bit emotional. My wife can say I get a very emotional when it comes to fishing and losing fish and catching fish, <laughs> but uh, that, that's a different conversation. So yeah, well, thank you. Well, and you, I mean, so you, you kind of cut your teeth, so to speak, maybe with, with Aaron, who's definitely a personality. Yeah. Um, yeah. With, that was uncut. Was that your first, yep. the first show you were filming for? And you did yeah, that that's, that's, for about yeah, five years? That's, yeah, five years or so. And that's kind of where I learned how to use, you know, video cameras and, and learn videography. I, I just got thrown into it, basically. And when you decided to kind of go and do your own thing, were you nervous about doing that? Or were you excited about that opportunity? Um, you know, it was like, that's, that's when my, you know, media business was, was, uh, I was probably on the road for, at that point in my life, I was probably on the road for like 200 days a year, just shooting like different wow. corporate and travel and tours and stuff. So I was like, Oh, you know what? I should start a YouTube channel and I can look back on these videos in a couple of years 
and it'll, it'll be cool. Cool memories, right? It was never like, no, I want to be. That's how it started? Yeah. Oh, really? Like, if you look at my first, if you look at my first couple of videos, it's like me, uh, you know, giving tips and tricks on like wedding photography or me going to Newfoundland with a buddy and just like bringing a camera along and, and trying to, trying to teach and just trying to document. And I was like, oh, this will be cool to watch back on. And it was never like, I'm going to become a YouTuber. It was like, I, I wanted, you know, it's, it's another, I'm making these videos. Like I said, I have an editor. Um, let's, let's make some videos and, and it'll be a cool way to document things. And it was, it was only really when like, um, you know, Manitoba tourism was like, mm. we, mm. we want you to, you know, help promote Manitoba and we'll, we'll help you build your YouTube channel. We'll help promote and we'll sponsor you financially. And I was just like, okay, yeah, like let's, let's try, let's see. Right. And, and then kind of after a year or two of that, then I was like, okay, well, you know, maybe I should start saying no to some of these other jobs and see what, what can happen with YouTube. And you know, the, the rest was just kind of putting my head down and, and making videos. And that's, and that's the tough thing about YouTube for breaking into it because like you need to be laser focused on it. You need mm-hmm. to be like, you know, I was, I was talking to some other guys and they're like, you know, we, we make TV shows, but like, how, how do you, you know, get into YouTube? And it's like, here's the thing. It's like, if I was focused on making TV shows, I wouldn't be focused on making YouTube videos. If I was focused on guiding, or like, let's say winning tournaments, there's very few, a lot of tournament anglers have YouTube channels, but there's not a lot of tournament anglers that can win tournaments and, you know, have thriving YouTube channels. There's like Brandon Palinick and like uh, Scott Martin. Those guys have been able to do the crossover and done both, but it's, it's, it's a tough deal. Cause as soon as you're focused on cameras, you're not focusing on catching fish. And it's, yeah. it's that inner battle all the time. And that's when people start filming. They're like, Jay, how do you, uh, how do you, how do you know when to like film and then just not get caught up in the fishing? And it's like, well, you just have to be, you know, you have to be focused on, on getting the shot. Otherwise, if you just get caught up in the fishing, you'll never get that video. Yeah. Right. You so. almost have to make that decision before you go. Am, am, am I going to yeah. film? Am I going to fish? Am I going to do a little bit of like, what's the priority here today? Yeah. And, yeah. It, you know, and it's funny, I, I do a lot with, uh, with tourism Saskatchewan over there and do some stuff with those guys and, and yeah. I'll go out fishing and, and to film some fishing and I'll do some fishing with them too, but they always want to start fishing right away. I'm like, guys, can I, can I get, a, can I put a microphone on you first? Oh, that's my pet peeve. <laughs> if someone drops down, especially my wife, I'll give her a hard time. Sam, if she, if she, like we get to the spot and she'll just like rig on, and you know, she, she's a good angler and she'll rig up a, a minnow on a rod and drop it down. And then she'll catch a fish and that'll just make my blood boil. I'm like, wait, <laughs> wait one second, wait till I'm ready. And I mean, I get it. She just, she, like, it takes so long to set everything up, which you don't, you don't see often. Right. It's just yeah. like, but it's, it's all good. Got to get that Sam cam fired up. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. So, um, you growing up, you wanted to, to have a fishing show, did you ever imagine it wouldn't be on an actual channel? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think, I don't think, I mean, you, yeah, YouTube wasn't YouTube a thing. YouTube wasn't a thing, like, yeah. And I, I've said this a couple times, but it's just like the fact that I've heard recently is like more kids want to be YouTubers and want to be astronauts. Not, not that I wanted to be an astronaut, but that was just like a thing kids said when they were right. age. They wanted to play in the NHL or something. And now it's like, oh, I want to be a YouTuber. And it just, it wasn't a, it wasn't a thing, even when, Aaron and uncut angling started in, in like 20, 2011, it was just like companies were unsure. It's like, Hey, do we really want to promote on YouTube? And now like, I don't know about you guys, but for me, I watch, I watch more YouTube than TV. Like I don't, I don't have a cable subscription. I don't have satellite. Like it's just the focus is, uh, YouTube. Cause it's, it's something current. It's, I can watch it right away. And yeah. Well, I go back and forth because I do an actual TV show too that airs on a yeah. bunch of PBS stations. So I still, yeah. and I'm an old radio guy, so I still have some love for traditional media, but you know, Dan is living here with me now and, and we're working on this stuff pretty much every day. And, and the last few nights, especially getting ready for this, we were watching, we were on YouTube every night watching videos, a lot of your stuff and, you know, just different. And then we're, we're having a, a party coming up in April on the rainy river. So, nice. um, we've been watching a bunch of spring fishing on the rainy river, which what was, oh, one, that's of, cool. one was yours too. Yeah. But, uh, so it, uh, YouTube is, a it's an interesting thing. And being a, a traditional media guy for a long time, I didn't, I didn't put a lot of stock into YouTube yet. And even podcasts for that matter. I'm like, I do a real radio show Pff, podcast. That, it's, now, funny, it's funny though. Like, because my, my dad, he's just retired, but he worked in the radio industry for 45 years. Oh really? And I always gave him grief. And I said, dad, 
you know, radio is on the way out. And he's like, no, no, you watch. And I said that to him for the past 10 years and radio is still, radio is still oh, crushing yeah. it. Right. Oh, yeah. And, and so it's like, it, it all has its place. I think it's, mm-hmm. it's shifting around, but I think, you know, I don't think TV is going to go away overnight. I think, I think radio is still, there's still things that you get with radio that you don't get with podcasts and you don't get with YouTube. So, yeah. Yeah, it, it's there's it'll, there'll always be a place for over the air broadcasts, and especially when you if you end up in a situation like what what's happening in Ukraine where they lost the internet. I mean, can you imagine? Could you imagine in America or even Canada for that matter if if the internet went away? Like what some of those well, people younger, would die with yeah. the younger generations? They'd have no idea. Like when I when I'm speaking to a younger generation, I use the word podcast before I use the word radio when I describe what I do. And you yeah. know, if I'm talking to an older crowd, I'm like, yeah, it's a radio show, and we also have the podcast. If it's a younger crowd, yeah, we have this podcast. You can watch it on yeah. YouTube. You know, <laughs> it's that's uh, great. You got it's all about knowing your audience. And then, so when you were. I want to talk about guiding too, because where are we at for time, Dan? We got to take another break, by the way. We're good. All right. So when you were 15, you started guiding yeah. at Eagle Nest Lodge in the Winnipeg River and you sunk a boat. Yeah. So I, I saw that. I saw you talk about it, but I don't think you told the story about sinking the boat. Can you tell the story? Did you tell the story? I, can't yeah, if you told. I, I can tell you the story. I've, I've, I've told the story a couple of times. Um, and it, I think it gets a little funnier every time. So yeah, I, when I, when I got dropped off to, to start guiding, I didn't have my drivers yet. So I was 15 at the time my parents dropped me off and, uh, I got shipped up to the lodge for the summer and it was like my first week of guiding. And we uh, were going into Portage Lake. So we would hop in the camp boats, little tillers with like 40 mercs. We would drive up to this other lake, park at the bottom of the waterfall, hike to the top, fish for the day, come back down. So we're coming back down after having a great day of fishing and you know, I'm feeling all proud. I'm young. I'm 15. We caught a bunch of walleyes. I'm like, this is a good day. This is the life we hop back in the boat and it had been raining all day. And you know, a trick that I knew before then was if there's water in the bottom of the boat and the bilge, the bilge wasn't working, the bilge pump, um, you pull the plug. And sure. as long as you're driving, the water will drain out the bottom. Right. So <laughs> I pull the plug. We start making our way back and it's a 40, 45 minute boat ride. So, you know, I have the memory of a goldfish if, if you know me <laughs> at all. And so we get back to the dock, all the water's drained out. I tie up the boat. I go up for dinner and there's like the guide quarters where all the guides are eating. And all of a sudden a guide comes in and he's like, Jay, or he, he, he addresses all the guys. He's like, guys, we all got to get out to the dock. We got a boat sinking. And I'm like, oh no, whose boat is sinking? I feel so bad for that guide. So we start walking down the dock. And as we get closer and closer, I'm just like, that's that's my dock slip and i see just the cowling of the motor sticking out (laughs) and i'm like no 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 there's no way this is mine so yeah of course it's my boat and they all look at me they're like okay jay you gotta hop back in so they give me a plug i hop in the water fully clothed put the plug back in the boat all four guides you know grab a corner of the boat lift it up they have like a commercial sub pump to pump out all the water and um they're like okay now you got to go tell the boss what happened so the owner is having a nice sit down dinner with his wife in the dining room. <laughs> so there I am dripping wet, 15 years old. I go up to the dining room. I'm like, Fred, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I pulled the plug and I forgot to put it back in and I sunk a boat. And he's like, okay, well, just don't do it again. And he was, he, he couldn't have been any better about it. The boat had to get shipped into Lac to get worked on. And it was fine. It was just like, had to drain the water out, but, uh, safe to say I've not made that mistake again. <laughs> and, uh, I've told, yeah, like people that, that story just spread like wildfire and it was, it was, it was funny. I can laugh about it. Um, yeah, that's great. But yeah, you know, I've, I, that's the only boat I've sunk. I've, I've hit my fair share of rocks, but that's it for sunk boats at least. And you, you got talked to on your first day too, because you outfished your clients. Guiding is, is a lot of people don't realize that guiding is a little bit different than fishing, isn't it? Oh yeah. 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 Like it's, it's a no, no looking back on it. And, and now that I've, I have been guided once in a while, when I go to film at a lodge, it's like, unless, unless the person you're fishing with very explicitly says, pick up a rod. I don't yeah. think the guide should be fishing. And that was just, you know, it's, it's me being green. That's, that was the best way to learn was I screwed up and I got sat down by, you know, the owner and the guide manager and they were so gracious about it. And they said, Jay, you, you just, you can't fish. These people are paying, paying a lot of money to come up here. You, yeah. you can't be fishing in front of them. I'm like, but they couldn't catch the fish. I wanted to catch the bass. <laughs> they were missing it. You know, so well, it's, sometimes, uh, I, I learned very quickly. I think there's something too about at least showing them how to catch it once in a while. I think the guy does. Yeah, to I, I think, I think a cast or two is okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. We got to take, a, we do have to take a quick break on the network. Actually, we're going to wrap up the radio show right now, but we got more on the podcast with Jay Siemens right after this. Keeping sheep on the mountain. 
Mountain. That's the goal of the Wild Sheep Foundation, and you can help by attending the Midwest chapter of the Wild Sheep Foundation's annual banquet, March 25th and 26th at the Minneapolis Marriott Southwest in Minnetonka. This year, you could win your very own doll sheep on the Yukon. Plus, enjoy keynote speakers like conservationist Shane Mahoney, president and CEO of the Wild Sheep Foundation, Gray Thornton, and the British Columbia Backcountry Hunters and Anglers chapter liaison, Bill Hanlon. Plus, there'll be live and silent auctions and seminars put on by the Hunt and Fool. For more information, go to MidwestWildSheep.com. 852 million acres of public land, 147 million private properties, all in the palm of your hand. The number one hunting GPS app just got better. With hundreds of custom map layers, 3D and topographic maps, you can easily scout on the road or at home before you go. And now you can get important weather details, CWD detection, and even know what crops have been planted where. Get the most trusted hunting GPS app ever made. Onyx. Know where you stand with Onyx. All right, we're back here on the podcast. Thank you very much for watching. Jay Siemens is our guest. Jay, I want to talk to you about traveling and filming some of these. I don't know what to call them. Like we, we do some trips where we film and make like a, like a vlog and I, I call them adventure videos or trip videos. I haven't quite figured out the, the best name for them yet. And I, I think my favorite from, from what you do is when you do the, the films, you got a whole playlist on YouTube of films and it's a, there's a week in the Yukon, a week in the Amazon and, you you tie in not only do you tie in the story of where you're going and some interviews and things like that but you work in so much of the cinematic elements to filming and i love the eye candy i mean that's i think that's my favorite content is king you have to have content i like to say like uh you could you could film Bigfoot with a 1998 flip phone and you're going to probably have the most widely viewed video in the world. Um, so you have to have some content, but making that, making it look good is, uh, is, is so important when you, when you go out and film something, do you know ahead of time, is this going to be a film? Is this going to be, um, you know, more, more of a vlog story? What's your thought process going into making a video? Yeah, so I it, typically something I would decide ahead of time. Um, there's different ways to look at it, and it depends. Like that Yukon trip, I could have split it into you know six different days, but I was like, that was that was my first like film, and I was like, I want to experiment. I want to try some voiceover. Uh, it'll be it'll be a way that I can tell a story in a different way. And so if I'm doing a one day trip, it, it likely won't turn into a film. There's there's not necessarily enough of a story. That might be I might be teaching a technique or just bringing you along for half day. But if I'm doing something you know bigger, a little more special, it'll probably turn into a film. And what makes it a film? You know, probably a little more leaning into the cinem cinematography side and then the voiceover. Um, but like when people ask me, they're like, Jay, what you know, what should I do? I, I want to make YouTube videos. What would you suggest for you know being successful? And it's like, well you got to make what you want to make. I, that Yukon video was like, I want to make it. Cause I want to make like, that's just, I want to be creative in that way. I want to make a film. So that was an experiment. And I think you always got to experiment as, as a creator. And it, 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 I think it worked out good. It got, you know, a good response. P people viewed it. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely like doing the film style and it's something that I think I look back on and I don't know. I know, I know the work that went into it, the editing on those films, uh, I'm locked away in my office for a long time working on those. And because there's just more room for creativity, like yeah. some of those films, I'll just for the sake of the flow, sometimes I'll combine days to make it flow a little better. I'll cut out complete days. Like uh, I went to the Arctic this summer and I just cut a couple days out of the trip because I didn't feel like they told the story in the way I wanted to tell it. Um, not, not to try to ever give someone a false perception of the fishing or something, but it's like, one day we went out uh, e-biking and I'm like, well, I don't, I don't think the fishing crowd is going to care about e-biking. The yeah. footage wasn't that special. Let's just scrap that entire day. So that day got cut out of the film. And that's something that, you know, you can decide to do when, when you're editing, right? You, you, you can call the shots and uh, the films are, yeah, they're, I, I like, I look looking back on them every once in a while and being like, oh, I remember that trip, especially the ones, you know, with my wife, it's, it's cool to have those memories on film. Absolutely. And by the way, Dan, play that last clip from Wolf Lake there that you played from the Yukon with Todd because this slow motion grayling footage I could just watch that on a loop like the the one where it comes up and eats the eats that fly man that that was incredible it was it was a special place like I when I when I walked up there and saw the grayling everywhere I'm like this right, right here I may never I may never be able to get grayling footage like that again so I spent you know a couple hours just filming the takes yeah and 
it's the type of thing where if I was just trying to film a video that day, I might not have taken all that time to do that. But in the sake of the film, I'm like, this might be one little piece in the film and uh, let, you know, let's do it. So um, yeah, I, th that's what I love about YouTube stuff is you can, you can change it up. There's no, there's no formula, right? It's not like I need to make a 22 minute TV show needs to be cut exactly yeah, to that. Right. And uh, you know, that's, make it as that's, long as you need to make video. it is what I like to tell people, you know, as yeah. long as you're, is, if it, if it, if it's compelling, people will watch it till the end, no matter how long it is. That's, that's there's, how I yeah. determine lengths a lot of times. Yeah. There's a, a, a phrase I heard in a, a storytelling workshop I went to. And the guy said, basically he said like, you want to leave, leave the scene or enter the scene late and leave the scene early in the fact that like give the people the best of the best and mm -hmm. not too much filler. So like at the end, it's like, Oh man, I, I can't wait till the next one. Cause That's... I don't, I don't want people to, I don't want people to be clicking off at 75%. Right. I want it to end and be like, Oh man, that was, I wanted more of that. I wanted to see more strikes, but it's like, no, you got, you got to, you know, keep them wanting. Right. That's so hard too, because you might have a great, another great shot that you yeah. feel like deserves to be in there. And it's like, how do you, how do you cut that stuff out? And you're right. You gotta, you, you gotta just make it the best of the best. And, and when, when all that work, you said you took, you spent hours getting that shot, not to mention traveling with all that gear. And I know what it's like yeah. to have to travel with all that gear and then put it on a float plane and travel with all that gear. Yeah. Packing is a nightmare. And then just trying to make sure nothing's right. Have you ever, how, how many cameras have you broken on some of these trips? Uh, I've gone through a lot of drones. I feel like drones oh, are the yeah. things I break the most, but I'm probably like my seventh or eighth drone. But over the last couple of years, I've just tried to streamline all of my gear and cameras are getting smaller. And mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is my workhorse for 95% of my stuff. Now this is an a seven S three. And it's amazing what this little camera can do and what's all packed into it. I used to need to carry this big camera along specifically for slow-mo shots. I would bring this big Sony FS five and I would use yeah. it just for, I would use it just for slow-mo shots and then it would go back in my backpack. And now I can do everything with that small camera and the drones fold up now, like the original phantoms, I'd have to bring an extra case on the float plane and now it folds up. So I can fit like, you know, professional level gear, everything I need in a backpack. And, you know, I try not to overcomplicate it because like we said, getting the Bigfoot shot with a flip phone is more important than not getting the shot at all. You get, yeah. you get these red cameras, these $60,000 cameras, and they take a minute to boot up. I can't tell you how many times like the animals right in front of you or the fish is right in front of you and you don't have time for the camera to boot up. So it's like a lot of people are watching the content on their phones or mm -hmm. on smaller, you know, computer screens. And it's like, I think there's a place for red cameras and all that high end stuff. But I've just realized that getting a shot will always trump the resolution or, yeah. you know, well, I've got a buddy that filmed with a films a TV show, a pretty big TV show, and he filmed with a red for a while, and then he started getting shooting with a GH5, and he's yeah. like, I, I couldn't tell. Like I was yeah. watching some of the footage, I couldn't tell half the time which camera was. So now he uses that GH5 so often, and I got so I went and bought a GH5, and then nice. and then my buddy had an R R6, the new Canon yeah. R6, and I played around with that, and I'm like, all right, I got to go buy an R6 now. So that's that's mostly what I shoot with, but we have S yeah. FS5s at nice. Prairie Sportsman at the TV show. How how nice is it with that uh, Sony that you're shooting? You're shooting slow motion with that Sony versus the FS5. Because yes, FS5 yeah. was good, good quality, but it was goofy how you had to work the slow motion on those. Yeah, like the the, uh, the FS5 had like the burst function, so you'd only get eight seconds of slow mo. Mm -hmm. And now with this camera, you can do uh, you know unlimited slow mo. The problem with that is sometimes you fill up way more uh, way more footage, right? Because before <laughs> I could wait till the, the there's this is getting real geeky and technical, but there's a setting <laughs> called N, there's a setting called end trigger, and basically it's always buffering whatever you're right. filming. When you press the button, it'll take the eight seconds before. So that's like the dream for filming top water strikes because you follow the lure every cast. Only when the fish eats, you count to four in your head, you press the button and it takes, you know, the eight seconds beforehand. So that was the best for filming top water. If I film it with this camera now, uh, you're just rolling continuous oh, and you God. fill up a lot of memory cards. I got so many clips of just the top water just going across the water, <laughs> you know, yeah. not, nothing happening. But yeah, I, I forgot. I guess that would be a nice situation to have that. I like a pre record or a uh, yeah. trigger or uh, something like that. But yeah. um, where, where, have, where do you want to travel that you haven't traveled to yet? Oh, man. Um, I definitely want to do more fishing in Europe. Like I, I don't, I've done, I don't even know if I've done any fishing in Europe. Um, 
yeah, like I, I'd love to do Xander. I love walleye fishing. So I think Xander is like the next step. Um, and I've got friends in Sweden too, that do a lot of pike fishing and perch fishing. So I think that would just be something unique. I love the, the cultural differences and stuff, um, there beyond, beyond them being, you know, different species of fish as well. So I, I think some Europe stuff would be cool. And I think there's, you know, more to see in, you know, South. I mean, yeah, there's, there's endless opportunities. So I, I just want, I, I get, I have an issue with going to the same place twice Sure. and you know, it, it's, it's a battle because then you know what you're, you know what you're getting into. You learn the fishery. And then when you come back, you've got all that, that info from last time. Like there's, you know, a walleye lake that's, you might want to go back to, but it's like, Oh, what if I go to the new lake and maybe I find something better. So that's, that's the constant battle for me. Cause I want to go everywhere once, which I know isn't realistic, but. Well, I was surprised to see the Amazon trip on your channel. And a lot of times if I see, ah, it, it's hard for me cause I, I, I'm expecting to see Canadian waters, you know? So yeah. I, I sat down and watched it. And it was fascinating and I loved it. It was not what I expected. And I actually went, I did a duck hunt in Argentina a few years ago. And cool. you, you talk about just kind of learn, learning the culture a little bit and going on an adventure to a different part of the world. I mean, that's, that's half of it. It was, it was interesting. And part of the excitement, I think, was just trying to learn how to communicate with people that didn't speak English, yeah. you know, try to learn the Spanish language a little bit. And that, and that gate, we're in Miami before you flew out. I'm pretty sure I slept on that floor right there. I'm pretty <laughs> sure I slept there a couple of weeks ago when I was down in Florida. I got stranded in oh, Miami overnight and I, and they were flying to Brazil out of that gate. So I'm pretty oh, really? sure it yeah. looks just like it, but, yeah. um, S South America is, uh, when you rode up to the boat that you ended up staying on. I shouldn't even call it a boat, the yacht or the, the yacht, floating yeah. hotel. The floating, or hotel. floating hotel is what they call it, yeah. When I saw the exterior of it, I was like, okay, this is interesting. This is kind of, you know, this this reminds me of South America a little bit. When you showed the interior, I was blown away. I didn't expect that. It was it was insane. That, that whole trip was, uh, it, it was just a moment that I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't want to get too excited about it till it actually happened, but basically it was a friend of a friend, a guy that I guided up in Northern Saskatchewan was neighbors with the owner of he, he is captain Peacock, the, the owner of the floating hotel. And he, he called me and it was like March 15th. And he's like, Oh, we'd love for you to, to come, you know, uh, and film at our lodge. I'm like, Oh, when does your season start? He's like, Oh, it starts in September. So I'm like, okay. Yeah. Like let's set in some days. He's like, Oh no, but, I want you to come before the season ends. Like I want, and I'm like, well, when, when does that mean? He's like, well, can you leave in a week? And for me, <laughs> oh I, I thrive off of the last minute, spontaneous, all, all sorts of that stuff. Like you could tell me tomorrow I'm going to Africa and I'd be like, okay, that's cool. My, my wife is a little more of a creature of habit, which is, is admirable as well. And I kind of, I remember calling her and I'm like, Sam, so we kind of need to make a decision by the end of today, but do you want to go to Brazil for 10 days? <laughs> and uh, it pushed her out of her comfort zone, but I think she would agree it's one of the one of her favorite trips she's ever been on. So yeah, we, we booked our, our flights like a week before and uh, every aspect of it was just uh, uh, surreal. Like it was, it was, you know, my wife likes fishing. It's not what she lives and dies for. And just the fact that there's a pool on top and there's air conditioning and there's like, just everything. It was, it was, uh, it was a pretty, pretty special place. So that is a place I would, I would certainly go back to would be uh, Captain sure. Peacock in Brazil. Well, it sounds like that air conditioning was welcome. It sounds like it was pretty oh, yeah. hot down there. And then I saw her catching a peacock and she was thumbing it. You were using a gripper. Is that, did they have teeth? Is there, what was the, what just was the big ones. I think they, the big ones they often use, I think you could, you could lift any fish, but the bigger ones, they just, uh, that's what the guide would do. Okay. Um, and then kind of hand it over to you sort of thing if they're landing oh, the fish. I gotcha. But yeah, we, we were so unlucky on that trip as far as big fish went. Like, um, cause every day you come back at the end of the day and you're sharing stories. And there was like, I think the biggest that, that week was a 20, there's a 22 pounder caught, you know, oh. uh, 20, 21 pounder, 17 pounder. And I think the biggest we got was a uh, seven or eight pounder. Maybe it was the one Sam caught. So that's just how it goes. Sometimes you don't always, you don't always get lucky on that side of things, but, um, yeah, I, I, I will go back there at some point and catch a, catch a double digit peacock. They're, yep. they're so cool that that's the closest thing I've seen to a freshwater fish or sorry, the closest thing I've seen to a saltwater fish for a freshwater fishing, like as far as aggression and like the tenacity and the fact that they can turn on and turn off so fast. Like I've, I've only seen that in saltwater fish before. I've never seen that in a freshwater fish. So that, that one that where it kicked your, your top water, like 10 feet or whatever. That yeah. was awesome. And then we got a show. So that big one, Sam caught the big one, right? 
It's about yeah. eight pounds of air. Do we have that? Yeah. We got the audio with this one because we had to keep the audio with this one because this is great. I just love the emotion on this. Do we have audio? Hook up. That's a big one. Man, it just popped my lure at me like 10 feet. Talk to me, Sam. Oh, keep it tight. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. That's a big one. Oh, my goodness. Come on. So, oh, oh. Dude. <laughs> yeah, the reaction's so good. Yeah. You can hold on with the bow grip if you want. Yeah, yeah there we go. Hold it a little bit higher. Yeah. yeah. One last look at that monster. Look at the colors on that. And that's only an eight pounder. They get so much bigger. All right, going over the side. Yeah, I can't imagine a 20 pounder. Right? Well, that whole sequence. And then I think, do we have the release shot? That whole sequence from, from kicking the kicking that top water to her catching it and the emotion of it. And then that release shot that you got on it, uh, that, I think that's my favorite part of that, that film that you did. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's just a different world down there. And those fish are, those fish are stunning. Like it's, uh, yeah. And it's just so funny. Like you said, with the language barrier and stuff too, like our guide's name was Nacho. I don't know if that's his actual name or what they, what they gave him, but like, Oh yeah. We just had no, it, he would just, he would know the word cast basically. And he would just tell us to keep casting at the same spot. And I remember one moment where like he kept telling us to cast at the same spot. And I don't think I'm necessarily the easiest person to guide. Cause I, I'll be honest. I don't really like being guided. Like if they would have given me the keys to the boat, I would have just gone off on my own. Um, and he kept telling us to cast the same tree and finally I'm like, Sam, I knew he, I like, I knew he wasn't understanding us. And I was like, Sam, I'm not going to cast at that tree anymore. And she's like, no, just, just keep casting at the tree. I'm like, We've cast that out so many times. And then I, I like I, my, my body language was probably showing a little bit that I was getting frustrated and I cast it at the tree again and caught one. And I'm like, he was right. He was right. I should always trust your guy. Always trust always your guy. Trust your guide. That's yeah. right. Um, the, uh, I, you know, that the most unexpected part of that trip though, was when you went to visit that village and they were, the, they had the doctors and the dentists with, I'm, yeah. I'm glad that was a part of it. That was a really neat, part of that film yeah so i mean basically he gives i don't know if he gives free trips or discounts to doctors and dentists and stuff but he he does the outreach to the community because i think that's i think that's something a lot of fishing lodges deal with is coming into these communities and kind of taking over you know whether it be you know on a, on a lake up north where there's a you know a native reservation or if it's down south where there's these villages along the, the rio Negro river um so it's cool. So they bring these doctors in, they get, you know, a discount or a free fishing trip, whatever it is. And then they go into the village and they'll give them free dental care, free health care. And it's a part of the trip and it's just a cool outreach. Um, and I, th I think a lot of people are like happy to do that on a trip, especially if you've got, you know, skills to share. It's like pe people are happy to, to, to share their skills. And I think that's a cool way that the lodge gives back. And yeah, I, I can't really say I've seen that with other, uh, you know, outfitters before. Well, you have to, if, especially if you're not, you know, local, if you're coming into a community like that, you have to find a way to give back to that community or work with them or, or help out. And man, I just, I just thought that was great that, uh, yeah. that they do that. And then the, the drone shot at the end of that big floating hotel, pulling all those boats crazy. Oh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know how many, how many aluminum boats they have on there. I think they have like, well, probably 12 or I don't know how many, yeah, probably 12 there. And it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty impressive to see that whole thing going like, and I wouldn't want to be the guy driving that. It would be, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's a lot of work to get it all set up and stuff, but I mean, they have it down to a science and they fit a lot of people on that, uh, on that barge. Yeah. Pretty cool. All just right. the engineering. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just to be able to, like, I get nervous towing one boat half the time. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, but being able to tow and just how, you know, how they have to hook them all up to keep them in line like that. That's pretty neat. Yeah. I want to talk about one more trip before we let you go here. I hope we're, I know we're keeping you pretty long today. No, you're uh, good. But I want to talk about that trip to, is it Isinglass? Yeah. Isinglass, the journey to Isinglass. Um, 
first, as a guy who who does some filming and some interviews, it was weird to see you doing a sit down interview in front of Ken. So interviewed myself in the backyard. <laughs> yeah, people are probably like, "Why is this guy filming himself?" But I just thought it was it was a way to a way to tell the story. But yeah, I, I'm. It's always funny interviewing yourself because you get some funny looks. If I was outside, so otherwise people wouldn't see it when I'm interviewing myself. Right. But <laughs> so, did you just pick out like a tree to stare at then, so it looked like you were, or did you have somebody uh, off camera? Actually, I, I think I think Sam. I think my wife was asking oh, okay. me questions. I, I don't I don't remember completely, but I just remember <laughs> like it's starting to snow and sleet, and I'm trying to mm -hmm. film this interview, and I was like, I got to get it done. Um, but yeah, that, that was uh, that was a. But that and the fries from the food truck looked amazing, by the way. <laughs> yes, that's a must. Yeah. Mm, in uh, but the colors. So you were on a row. Oh, yeah. Here's the we got to show you the fries on the from the food truck. So that's a chip truck. The chip truck. There's a couple of those in Kenora and it's uh, yeah, pretty much. They just sell French fries and oh, yeah. uh, it's it's a it's a must stop for anyone coming through. Mm, so good. Um, so you got to go to go to Isinglass. So you got to go down a road that you had to get a permit for. Is that right? Yeah. So it, I mean, there, yeah, we could, we could go down a rabbit hole talking about eyes and glass and, and everything beyond that. Um, so yeah, there, there's an old mining road and basically if you are, uh, you know, part of the, part of the mining, if you're, if you're doing work on that road, then you can get a pass to, to go down that road. And we're like, well, we're doing tourism and tourism is kind of like a, a resource. So, uh, you know, my neighbor, Scott, who I've, you know, partnered with on a few projects, he's like, well, we'll see if we can get a permit. So he, he got this permit and it allowed us to get, you know, close to the lake, not right to the lake. And then to bring in the scuba gear and all that stuff. Um, because we could have done it portaging, but I just don't think it would have been as realistic. Um, given how cold it was time of year, all that stuff. So we were pretty fortunate to be able to do that. And just to, to show, to show the area in, in a different way, right? Like anyone could do this trip and do it without traveling the road. It would just take a, a little bit longer. And, you know, most people aren't taking camera gear and all that extra gear that we took. Right. right. So people could, you know, portage in there with, with scuba gear and do it on their own. Well, being able to dive in a, you know, clear Canadian Lake like that had to have been amazing. And I, I need to get certified cause I want to do that and I want to get an underwater housing and I want to do some shooting underwater. I think that would be just fascinating. And this, this lake trout footage that you got, and I, I do so much with Lakers up in Saskatchewan. I want to do this so bad. I can, I can run like a, an inline camera down to about 60 feet without any lights yeah. and, and get footage. I would love to go down there with a big camera and shoot fish like this. That had a yeah, cool. that was pretty unique. And they were, they're, they're kind of spooky though. But yeah, that day was like a blizzard above the water. And, um, <laughs> but it was something, something I wanted to do. Cause I haven't really seen too much aside from aqua view of like swimming, swimming with lake trout. They weren't big ones. Those were all like two, three pounders, sure. but, um, you know, something, something unique. And yeah, the scuba world is definitely, uh, unlocked, you know, all sorts of filming potential and, and you just learn. I, that, that's the reason I wanted to get into scuba diving beyond the video content aspect. It was just like, I want to learn what fish do and how they react. And like, you know, I've yet to see a walleye underwater, but I've seen bass because bass will come up to you and you knock rocks together and they'll come right up to you. Walleyes, you kind of see a dust cloud. And it's like, there probably used to be a walleye there, but he's a little smart. <laughs> he's gone. Food, so, well, we got some yeah. mine lakes up around uh, Crosby, Minnesota, uh, the Cayuna lakes where guys will go with dive gear and cameras and then ice fishing rods. And they'll, nice. they'll sit right down on the bottom of the lake and they'll jig for small mouth and large mouth and they'll catch That's them on cool. ice rods sitting on the bottom of the lake. It's pretty neat. And without getting too nerdy into, into cameras, camera stuff, like how, when you got that footage of those lake trout, like how, how soon did you try to review footage and how cool was it? Like when you get that feeling that you just captured something that you've never seen before, how cool of a feeling is that? Yeah. I, I like, I want to guard that memory card. I'm like nervous pulling it out and then putting it into the computer for the first time. <laughs> yeah. I have like this, this one story that I was, uh, I was guiding and the guest caught a 46 or 47 inch pike. And I pulled the memory card out and at the lodge I was working at, they had a person called a photo tech and they would categorize all the photos and make a slideshow for the guests. Sure. And I handed the memory card to the photo tech. And when she put it into the back of the computer, she put it in at a, at a weird angle oh, and the no. card just split open and they lost all their photos and it was just like, how do you, how do you come back from that? How do you explain cool. that to your guests? I, uh, you know, I've had a situation, you know, losing wedding photos for a client, which has only happened oh, once. Boy. And it was only some of the photos, but it's like, same thing. I have been fortunate with, with outdoor stuff that I haven't, I haven't really had any catastrophic losses, but that's always in the back of my head. So like, especially when I'm dealing with underwater stuff, 
I'll often bring my laptop in the boat and I'll actually back it up on location sometimes, or just to make sure the camera's filming. Cause sometimes with the underwater stuff, you don't always know for sure if it's filming, uh, you know, if I have my camera in housing, I can, I can, you know, review the footage, but there's always that off chance that something gets messed up. So I, yeah, I knock on wood. I've been pretty fortunate with not losing much of that stuff, but it's always, uh, it's always in the back of my head, you know, sure. well, or if I, I'm pressing record or not. Yeah. Well, I, I was just down in, in Florida at Bienville shooting the Shimano thing. And, uh, I, I was in the boat with one of the pros and he, he caught this bass and it was in trees, right? So it was bouncing yeah. up through logs and bouncing and rolling over branches and this and that. And I had it all in slow-mo and I'm like, oh my gosh, because yeah. the slow-mo records without sound. So I'm like, this is amazing. This is going to be so cool. Yeah. And I'm talking to him as I'm getting it. He brings it in. I interview him in the boat. He talks about his, you know, why he's using braid. And this is why yeah. this is a great example, the tough gear that we use. And did then there's not, no audio. Did not, well, I didn't hit record. I missed the whole oh. fish. So I thought it was oh. rolling, but uh, apparently when I pressed the button, I didn't press down hard enough. And then I was focusing so much on, on my focus peaking and getting the shot and framing and all that. Yeah. I didn't, I couldn't see the little red record up in the corner. And, uh, but uh, you know, that's the way it goes sometimes. Um, oh yeah. I mean, that, that's just, it's, if you do it long enough, it's going to happen. It's going to like, happen. it's just, yeah. Yeah, for sure. A couple of, just a couple of last things on that trip, yeah. that raft. I didn't expect to see a raft but with the two canoes built like that. That was pretty wild. I'd, I'd never seen that before. Yeah. My, my, my buddy Scotty who planned the trip, he, uh, that was his brainchild and it was so stable. And Sam was, my wife, Sam was the captain in the middle sitting there. She didn't even have to paddle. So it was perfect <laughs> for her and it was cool. You know, it, it was all, you know, part of the story and being able to show that. And, you know, that's what I like about those longer films too, is you can, you can get into the story and it's not just, uh, it's not always cut, cut and dry to the, the, the bare bones. You can yeah, like look at all the gear we had on there. Right. Yeah. That's brilliant. So obviously it was fairly calm that day. How stable do you yeah. think that would have been in some higher winds? Oh, it would have been good. You would have gotten like splashes of water over the front, but it would have been, yeah, incredibly stable. Yeah. It, and the colors on those trees. I mean, that was perfect timing. Out it was there. the best time of year. Yeah. Like we didn't see any lake trout on the first lake. We had to go to a different lake to find lake trout, but just as far as timing goes for color and the clarity of the water, it was just... Yeah. Like as soon as I looked at it on Google maps, I'm like, okay, this, this lake is pretty special. And that's what I heard. And, and that video, it, it definitely got a little bit of kickback and that's, that's mm -hmm. the problem with what I do. And I think these days with social media is, is it's a fine line because conservation comes from people knowing about stuff, but people don't always want you to know about stuff. Oh, so it's right. just like in that video, I'm like, let's protect this resource. It's a special place. And I, I know a couple of people uh, that messaged me or I heard through the grapevine and they're like, I can't believe Jay showed that lake. I can't believe he exposed Isinglass. Uh. And, and it's, I don't know exactly the reasoning. Some people, it might be legit reasoning that they just don't want people there. Other people want to keep it by themselves. But fun little fact about that video is, yeah, it got backlash. I got multiple messages from people, but there was a big meeting with some, you know, big corporations and they wanted to create a mine on that lake. And they were in the stages of getting approval to build a mine on Isinglass. And that video got shown at the meeting and they voted down building the mine on the lake. Get and out it's of just here. like, yeah. And that I only found, I only found out that a couple months ago and like, it gives me goosebumps just talking about it. Cause I haven't shared that story with anyone, but it's just like, th that goes back to what I said at the start is conservation only comes with people knowing about stuff. So it's just like, it's like, you know, if, if I, I don't want to take credit for that because the, the video is so much bigger than me, but it's just like, maybe, maybe it helped. Maybe that was part of the reason why it got voted down. So, I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to think that I like to think that it helped protect that lake, but I think sometimes people are a little short sighted on yeah. their own personal, you know, motives on that stuff. And I, I get that it's nice to be on a lake when you never see anybody, but yeah. I love the outdoors and I'd love to share it. And it's like, if you want to go to the work of paddling in there, um, you know, do it and, and bring people and, and pick up your trash when you're done. And it's great, you know? Yeah. So that's the beauty of places like that. Um, you know, as long as you make it, a, you know, create a few barriers to make it tough to get in, you can usually keep some of those places fairly like the boundary waters, keep them fairly wild. If they're, if they're tough to get in, you know, they try to build a cell tower by the boundary waters here for a long time. I can't remember if they actually ended up building it, but they didn't want it built. The locals didn't want it built because I was just going to bring more traffic and make it easier yeah. to be in there. Um, and, and, the, and that brings up a whole other discussion. This is probably for a different podcast, but that brings up another discussion of, of um, social media and how to use it. And, yeah. and you want 
to show people some of these things and show some some stories. And, you know, for our TV show, a lot of times if we're doing a fishing story, we won't we won't name the lake sometimes for that very yep. reason. We'll try to protect, unless it's Lake of the Woods or Mille Lacs, you know, some big body of water. That's, it's no yep. secret, but we'll try to protect some of those areas, but it's so hard, especially when you find such a unique story. And I've got a couple of stories in the back of my brain that I've wanted to do, you know, a, a, a go and film or interview or whatever. And they won't let me They're like, no, we yep. don't, we don't want the attention. I'm like, this is an amazing story. And they're like, well, it's, it's our story and you know about it and that's good enough for us. And I was like, well, yeah, I, I respect that, I guess, but man, it's that's tough. it's it. Yeah. No, go ahead. No, it's, it's, it's just that constant fine line. It's just like, you know, you hear, you hear stories both ways, you know? Mm -hmm. So, well, that's it's just something we need to navigate. And, and, and I think, you know, put, put good information out there too on, on selective harvest on catch and release and all those things. I think it's like, that's part of the duty as well. Not just like, here's how you catch them. Here's yeah. how you release them too. If, if you catch a big one or if you don't, you know, so. That's really become a big part of what we do here is to try to protect, uh, protect our resources and, and promote sustainability. Uh, we yep. love to eat fish and, uh, and obviously there's a product I want to try on some of my fish, by the way, that we can mention. But, um, I also, you know, at, at Taz and Lake, where I do a lot of stuff, I'm in, I'm in Northwest Saskatchewan. It's all catch and release yeah. on the big fish. We don't, yep. guys get mad at us because we won't let them mount, you know, a 50 pound lake trout. And it's like, well, you get a good picture of it. We got a girth yeah. measurement. We got a length measurement and get a replica done. And it's going to last a lot longer and look a lot better. And it's going to yeah. protect the resource. Absolutely. So that sustainability is a, an important thing. Uh, before we let you go, tell us about uh, the cooking world that you're getting into. Yeah, you know, uh, I was in uh, in the ice shack with my buddy Josh McFadden. This was probably two years ago, two and a half years ago. And, you know, Josh, Josh is a major foodie. He's always experimenting with wild game and different things. And um, he, we were cooking fish. And then uh, I was like, you know what, we should we should start, you know, maybe, maybe a fish batter company. Maybe we can market this and turn this into something. And, uh, we started looking around cause like the big term on YouTube was catch and cook. And it was just like that. That's what people called it. They'd catch fish, they'd cook them. And I'm like, I wonder if there's a business called catch and cook. So we started searching and there was no business called catch and cook. And it's like, how, how is this possible? How is, how is nobody taking this yet? So I think that was part of the reason why we're like, let's, let's start this up. So Josh had the original recipe. I tried it. I was like, okay, I sign off on this. I, I like it. So I've been, I've been in the product development, uh, you know, with the other flavors since we got three flavors of coatings, we got three spices, we dropped a, a folding fillet knife. Mm. Um, and, uh, th the reception has been phenomenal. It's, it's been super cool to, uh, yeah, to share it with, with my audience and with, you know, people that just love to eat fish. Cause I think the vast majority of people and, and, you know, we, we often say it's a fish coating, but it's for everything. You know, you can, it's cool to see how people have experimented with it and they'll use it for, you know, grouse or use it sure. for uh, anything, for shrimp, for, for chicken, whatever, whatever they have accessible and just people sharing it with me, seeing what they're doing and, you know, getting creative with it. And we want it to be like an interactive, uh, an interactive space. And um, that's, that's kind of what Catch and Cook is, has become. And, uh, so right now you can order it off our website, but we're working on getting it into the States. So if, okay. if someone listening right now happens to, uh, own a tackle store in the States, that that's our goal for our, our focus for 2022 is, you know, getting it onto the shelves in the States, um, at a, at a Bain tackle shop near you. So do you I, mean, I think I, do you, sorry, I'm sorry, do you get sales in the States from your website? How, how easy yeah, is yeah, that? We get, yeah, that's super easy. If someone wants to order from catchandcook.net, they can do that. Um, but I know not everyone wants to pay for the shipping. Right. right. Um, cause I, I personally didn't think people, I didn't know. I'm like, will people buy fish batter online? Is that a thing? And then people have bought online. So that's been great. Mm -hmm. But I understand that fish coating spices is the type of thing where you go fishing for the day, you stop at the tackle store on the way home and you pick up some coating. It's not the type of thing that I would necessarily think about, Oh, I need to order some before this trip. I'd pick some up at the local gas station. Right. So that's what we're trying to, uh, you know, expand into, we know there's a lot of fishermen in the States that eat fish. So we, uh, you know, it's, it's been fun. I think, uh, we're going to continue to go ahead. Can I just point out one thing? You started, uh, a company with, a with a guy that involves food and he served you uncooked sausages, I think. Right. Wasn't that, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. You're, you're very true. Yeah. He hasn't lived that one down. People got a lot of laughs out of that. There's a clip in one of our videos and, and Josh has this, this sausage he got from uh, 
some, some an Asian cooking store. So it's got all, I, I'm not sure what the writing is on there, but obviously, you know, there's a little bit of English. And then, so we're starting eating these sausages. It's kind of sweet and kind of, you know, kind of a weird texture and flavor. And then like uh, underneath a lot of the, the text, it just says, do not eat raw in English in like really small writing. And I'm just, and then I spit it out. He spits it out. And uh, we turned it into a TikTok that got a lot of views. It was pretty funny because it's just like one of those little small moments in the, in the video. And it's just like, uh, like, I, I don't, I don't hold it. Neither of us got sick. So I don't, I don't hold it against him, but, and that's the thing too. It's like, you never know what you're going to capture when the camera's rolling all day. You just like, I do a lot of stupid stuff. A lot of it I added out. Some of it stays in, but like just goofy stuff like that. Right. Eating undercooked so- or uncooked sausages. That's great. Well, um, I'll tell you what, man, you know, I'm sure people tell you you live in the dream and it's, it's this, it's this era's version of watching that television host when when we were young, right? Like this is the new, this is the new outdoor job that everybody I think wants to have. And I think you've kind of, you're, you're, you've set a benchmark for creating outdoor content, outdoor video content. And, um, you know, I think you're doing a great job. Keep up the good work. Um, I really appreciate the, t- the time here on the show. And what can we look forward to here in the future? What do you got next? Well, well first off, thank you. I, I, I want to say, like, I know that I'm the luckiest guy. Like, I'm living, I'm living my dream every day, and I'm, I'm so blessed that, that people actually want to watch the videos because you upload a video and, I don't know, you think maybe no, one, no one's going to watch it, right? So know. just the, the, fact yeah. that, the fact that people are watching is cool. Um, what's next? Um, Things, things will probably slow down for a, like a little bit. I, uh, I got a couple like bigger projects, a couple of films, actually my first moose hunt. Cool. Um, I went to Texas for a week and did a bunch of bass fishing. So that'll be like a longer format film as well. Um, things are probably going to slow down a little bit now because, you know, I think a lot of the Midwest and a lot of, a lot of people are just have their eyes set on open water on springtime already. So a lot of the ice fishing content I'll film in the next month will actually be stockpiled for October November when people are getting revved up for ice fishing. So I'm going to be ice fishing pretty much every day for the next three weeks. Um, but all that footage is going to be kind of waiting for waiting for next year. So, um, I'm not sure exactly what my YouTube channel is going to look like in the next six months in June. Um, in June, my going to have my first child. So oh, yeah, uh, that's right. Ba- baby on the way in June. So Congrats. I don't know, like I, thank you. I, I've already had the discussion with my wife, like, how do we feel about having, you know, showing, showing that in, in our content, you know, having, having our, our baby boy part of it. And, uh, you know, I, I think I want to show, I want to show the, the, the real struggles of being a parent and doing outdoor stuff. And, uh, cause that's something I've always strived for on the channel is to be relatable. And mm-hmm. I know it's not going to be easy. Um, I'm 110% excited, but there's going to be, there's going to be tough things. Like how, how do you bring a kid fishing? How do you bring a kid ice fishing? and not ruin the sport for them. But, uh, you know, obviously with it, with an infant, they don't really know what's going on, but when they get older, like, what does that look like? So, uh, I'm ready to navigate that and share that with, with the people that, that watch the videos. So, so it, it used to be a thing to film the birth. I, I think there needs to be a lot of slow-mo and get the drone. If can you get the drone into the <laughs> hospital? And, yeah. No. We've made jokes about, about Sam wearing the Sam cam about the GoPro. And <laughs> she told me she wants me to take pictures and I'm just like, ah, I don't know. I'm just like, I feel like this is a sacred moment. Yeah. Um, That's but tough. we'll see whatever, you know, and she's, she has to carry the baby around. Um, for all those weeks. So whatever she wants me to do, I will do and just try to be the best father possible. And uh, if that means taking pictures or if she just needs to squeeze my hand, then that's, that's, that's what'll happen. But I'm, ex- I'm excited for the next chapter. It'll, it'll, it'll shake things up, but we'll, it'll we'll change the world. Out. No doubt. Yeah. Well, man, uh, again, appreciate the time. Keep up the good work and uh, thanks for being on the show and good luck. Good luck uh, in June. Thank you guys. Sporting Journal Radio is a division of Macaba LLC. If you've got a question, comment, or story idea for us, send us an email. Go to sportingjournalradio.com. While you're there, you can learn how to advertise on the show and visit our store for hats, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. Go to sportingjournalradio.com.